with me to Hebrews chapter 10 will be our text this morning and we'll be reading in just a few moments verses 11 through 18. Hebrews chapter 10, a little bit of a different place than we have been recently. <clears throat> verses 11 through 18. Welcome, welcome. It is good to see everyone here Springtime has officially arrived. April showers bring May showers. Isn't that the way that it goes? I heard that somewhere. <clears throat> it is an amazing and a beautiful time of the year. A time that reminds us as the Lord brings what? Brings like old dead things to life. That's what God does for us, in us, every single day. Let me tell you how it's going to go this morning. We're going to read the text in just a moment. And then we're going to back up quite far to set the context of, of this passage. And then we're going to arrive at one particular verse, uh, verse 14, we want to draw attention to in, in Hebrews chapter 10. And Lord willing, come away with two truths that we need to be reminded of as far as the Lord doing an amazing work in our lives I find oftentimes that it's challenge, 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 challenge. And I just want to just go to God's word and encourage you, just encourage you today with who the Lord is and what the Lord is doing. Now, first and foremost, we need to pray. I need to ask for the Lord's help that we would direct all of the craziness of our uh, past week. And we would, we would just gather our thoughts and our attention on the Lord and the Lord alone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you, Lord, that you've given to us another day to meet together. We thank you for the freedoms and the graces that you've given that allow us to worship like this in this place. We thank you, Lord, that we have your perfect word, precious, powerful word, that is before us, that it is alive. And Lord, not only do we have your word to us, but we have your own presence, your spirit here with us. Father, I pray right now for every person that is sitting here, every person that's listening to this message, that they, Lord, would be encouraged. Just encouraged over who you are and all of your greatness, and all of your glory, and what you are doing, what you desire to do in our lives. Father, we thank you that there is an amazing hope through the good news of the gospel that we can celebrate that every day, Lord willing, all day. God, help us to just get a glimpse of you. We love you, and we thank you for loving us. Please, Lord, I ask for help as I speak, that you would be the focus, you would be heard, and that you would receive all, all of the glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Uh, there's a great word picture that is created in Scripture um, back in Jeremiah in chapter 18. The prophet says, and he's speaking of the Lord, he says, like like clay in the hands of a potter, so are you in my hands. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful picture. So are, so are we in the Lord's hands as he's shaping us and molding us and making us. Um, I took a pottery class. I was working on the attempt to become a Renaissance man. It's not going very, very well at all. I, a number of years ago, I took a pottery class from a throwback hippie. Her name was, was Rose Vaughn back when we were living in Canada. And um, great instruction, and I think she was a great teacher. And, and I began one particular time after being given the, the right ingredients and, and how to do this, and your hands have to have water and you have to shape and everything. And I was going to make a, a, a mug, like a coffee mug. I thought that would be a wonderful idea. It worked, worked a long time. What's interesting is that coffee mug didn't, didn't work exactly as I planned, but it did turn into a beautiful elephant. Um, it, it was an Asian elephant. It had little small ears, the difference between African elephants that have large ears. This was an Asian elephant, and I painted it blue. 
I remember that. I thought about it. I thought, you know what? If you go to Jeremiah chapter 18, I'm thankful that the Lord is a better potter than I am, than we are. We get a focus this morning, and today um, I just want to encourage you. If you have put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you with what, what Christ is, is presently doing in your life. Or, or if you are here this morning, you're listening to this message, and you have not put your faith in Christ's work, that I want to encourage you with what Christ can do, and I, and I will say wants to do, with your life if you trust him. Let me, let me show you, Lord willing, how encouraging the work of God is in people's lives. Let's read Hebrews chapter 10. We pick it up in verse 11 down through verse 18. Listen very carefully about how God is molding us, shaping us, making us. We can be so encouraged by that. Hebrews 10, verse 11. And every priest, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The Holy Spirit also bears witness to us for, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. How are we encouraged from these words this morning? Let's set the context a little bit. You are holding in your hands a book. Or perhaps you have words on a tablet or a phone in front of you that is no ordinary book. These are no ordinary words. We know that this one book, the Bible, is divided into two testaments the old and the new. There's, there's 66 smaller books, 39 old and 27 new. We know that we hold in our hands this book that's written by more than 40 authors over a span of 1,500 years, written in three languages on three different continents. We know that in this book, it includes historical record, and it, it includes genealogies, family history, it, it, inju- it, it includes drama, and in these words are intrigue and action and romance. There's poems, there's songs, there's suspense, there's horror, there's humor, all within the Word of God. And they're encompassed what's within several genres of, of literature. There's historical narrative and there's law, there's wisdom literature, there's prophetical uh, literature, there's gospel and epistolatory all forms of literature that we have in the Word of God, and yet all the complexity and the diversity of the Word of God, there is one theme, one theme. From Genesis chapter 1, all the way back, I said I would set the context, we'd go all the way back. It begins with what? Beauty, the Garden of Eden, husband and wife, They were naked and not ashamed. Beauty and sinless perfection. Genesis chapter 1. In Revelation chapter 22, it ends with what? Beauty and sinless perfection. From from the very creation of man to the conclusion of, of God's plan for mankind as we know it, there is one message that goes all the way through the Bible. And it is what? God's gracious, gracious plan to redeem needy sinners. 
Now, what's interesting is in between Genesis chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 2, there are what? There is a holy mess. There are people just like you and I all the way through this book. There are men and there are women. There are old people and young people. There are rich people and poor people and fat people and skinny people and tall people and short people. There are introverts and there are extroverts. Everyone is in that Bible, just like what? Everyone in the entire world. People just like us. In the Old Testament, all of what the message of God's word points to the promised Messiah, the one who will redeem, the one who will rescue. And we know in the works of the New Testament, it reveals and explains who that Messiah is, Jesus the Christ, and what specifically that Messiah did. God came to earth. He descended from heaven. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He taught radical, crazy truth, different from the entire culture, different from anything the world has ever heard. He died a horrific death on a cross. He was raised miraculously to life again. He ascended back to heaven where he sits at the right hand of the heavenly father interceding on our behalf. All of time, all of time, every day you put the date somewhere on a piece of paper, all of time is marked by that one person before Christ or what? What? In the year of our Lord as we are living presently. Did you realize that? That you hold in your hands a book that was written in 2 Peter 1 says what? Written by men who spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Like this this book is different than everything else. Be encouraged with what you hold in your hands this morning. Realize that this book, what is given by inspiration, is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, instruction, righteousness. Do you realize that for more than two millennia that whole societies, countries, and cultures have attempted to rid the influence of the Bible, to extinguish its influence, to to shut it up, to shut it down, to to turn the light off. And they, they have not been able to do that. Why? Because they cannot do it. Do you realize that hundreds of thousands, if not millions, have died for the book that you hold on your lap today? And their unflinching faith in it and their faith in the one who this word is about. Do you realize that? Do you realize that every single thing that we see around us, as what it says in Isaiah and 1 Peter chapter 1, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Today, this book that we will be encouraged with remains the greatest selling book of all time. Why? Because it speaks to us and because it is alive. It helps us to learn to live by. We know what? It is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. One of my favorite descriptions of the word of God is from Hebrews. It says that it is quick and it is powerful. Something that I am not. It is quick And it is powerful. What's interesting is that this book is very easy for all of us to identify with. All of us. Why? Because it's filled with people just like us. People what? Every single one of them have sinned. Just like us. Every single one of them. That's a tough term. We're we're, we're to be encouraged today. And we automatically get, Pastor Tim, you're back on the word sin again. Well, well, that's a tough word, tough truth, hard word. And so there's different what ways to describe it. And so, so we use a, a host of different words that describe what people have sinned. And it basically means exactly the same thing. They've missed the mark. That's how the word sin actually translates. Other words that we hear that describe, but it doesn't sound quite, they, they, they messed up or they screwed up, or they, they blew it, or they botched it, or they dropped the ball, they, they, they got trapped, or they got tricked, or they what made poor choices. Call it whatever you want to call it. All of us what fall short 
of the glory of God, as Romans chapter 3 says. And we're like, okay, well, we get it. We can identify this with this. But thankfully, and here's the best part. Every single person that we see all the way through, from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 2, all the way through, God still loves those people. God still loves them, just like God still loves us. I don't know about that, about you, but that is, that's good news in my book. That's great news. And we see, we literally see and we hear the proof of God's love through the process of salvation and sanctification all the way through the Bible, which brings us back to Hebrews chapter 10. Let me direct your attention to verse 14. It says this, by one, by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being saved. Let me give you two points this morning. The first one is this, as God is at work, the work of salvation is complete and it's perfect. The work of salvation, God is, he is molding us. He's a better potter than we are. The work of salvation is complete, it's done, and it's perfect. Hebrews is written, what, to Hebrew people or a a Jewish audience. These people knew well the sacrificial system, literally spelled out in the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They knew about the idea of, of having to bring offerings or make sacrifices in order to atone for their sins. They, they knew about this. Basically, the father or the, or the head of the household would have to regularly take grains or flowers, ground grains, or, or, or turtle doves, or, or a young goat, or a sheep, or even a, a young bull, and they would regularly take them to the priest in order to be sacrificed for their sins. The problem is this. They had to keep going back to the priest over and over and over again. Why? Because people kept sinning. This is like, this is tough. You got, you got to like, you got to raise this animal. You got to feed this animal. You got to take care of this animal. And then you're going to just, just take this animal and it's going to be killed. All of that stopped. All of it stopped. What? Romans chapter six and verse 10. All of it stopped. All of it changed with Christ. It says this in Romans 6, he died to sin once for all. There had to be a sigh of relief, but there wasn't. We know what 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And we just read again in Hebrews chapter 10, by one or by one single offering, he has perfected for all time. What, like, what does this mean? Like, how is this encouraging for us this morning? When the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth and died on this cross, he paid the price for forgiveness from our sins for all people for all time. Salvation occurs, what? When we trust that. that that's when salvation, when we put our faith and our, 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 our belief in the work of Christ and his sufficiency, not our own. Why? Because we're the bad potters. We're the ones who mess up. And we see that all the way through. So, so Christ, he suffers once and for all time, and we're perfect in our salvation. Yes, does that mean that we are perfect? No. Does it mean that you and I don't, don't sin any longer? That we're perfect in our attitude and our behavior? Uh, no. What is this word perfect? It's the Greek word teleo. It means completed or finished salvation, the work of salvation. We no longer have to take sacrifices to the temple any longer. That work is done because of Christ. How done is it? I love the picture that is created here. Jesus, what? When he finished, he sat down. When you come home from a long day at work, what do you do? You sit down. It's done. The day is over. Your work is completed. You don't have to go back and do it again. That day is done. The time is coming, what? That he will soon put his feet up and literally use the enemies, Satan and his minions. What? For a footstool. 
that day is coming. But at this point, he is sitting down. The work is completed. But yet all of us know that we still, we still drop the ball. Therefore, we are still being sanctified. We are being set apart or consecrated, made holy. The Holy Spirit works within us, but also other people around us, others speaking into our life, assist us in this process of sanctification. Jameson Fawcett and Brown says it like this, the sanctification and concentration to God of the elect believers are perfect in Christ once and for all. But listen to this, the development of that sanctification is progressive. Which brings us to our second point this morning. The work of sanctification is promised and it is progressive. We know that salvation is is perfect and it's complete. It's done. Salvation, if you put your faith and your trust, salvation exists. Sanctification is what? It is progressive. It's going to take time. That's where we need to be encouraged about what God is doing, knowing that you don't have to be perfect because you can't be perfect. To me, that is like a a sigh of relief. Like I don't have to pretend to have it all together because it's impossible for me. Therefore, I must trust the word of God, the spirit of God, and the people of God to speak into my life because they are actively at work regardless of how unlovable we are, God still loves us unconditionally. So much so it says in Romans chapter 8, there's nothing that you and I can ever do that will ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you realize that? There's nothing that you can do. And like, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of junk that goes on in here. And like we, we struggle and we stumble every day, every week. There's nothing that you can do that will ever separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Be encouraged by that. How did I get to this whole thought? It was actually on the tail end of Jonah. As I was kind of wrapping up Jonah, I thought, you know what? This, this boy is a mess in every way. And yet, for some reason, God never gave up on Jonah. And I was thrilled by that. God never gave up on Jonah, just like God will never give up on on us. Matter of fact, God even called Jonah and used Jonah to do a great work. The boy is a mess, and God called him to accomplish a great work. What? In earth-shattering revival breaks out in arguably what? One of the most deplorable places in the known worlds. In in that, we saw God's sovereignty. We saw his grace and his love all over the place. And it got got me thinking, back to Genesis chapter 1 and this story, and I began to list people. And I'm like, like, who's a mess, and who is it that God used? And who is it that God loves to use, although they were a mess? The list is long. Abraham and Sarah laughed at God when they said that they were going to have a baby. They, They laughed at God, displaying their disbelief. Like, yeah, you got the wrong couple here, God. And then what? Another time we know that Abraham lied that his wife was actually his sister. And he did that two occasions on two different times. And yet, do you realize there's two different references in the Old Testament that refers to Abraham who laughed in God's face? Two descriptions, both in the Old Testament. What? Uh, 2 Chronicles 20 and Isaiah chapter 41, that Abraham is called and described as a friend of God. Abraham laughed at him. And yet God still loved him. Moses, the great Moses, the Moses, had a pretty troubling past. He was 40 years old. He was furious. He sold an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. So he took care of it himself, a vigilante, we would call it. And he killed the man, buried him in the sand. He took off. Like he is a murderer, a cold-blooded murderer. Flew to, what, the wilderness to start a new life. And yet God called him, I think you would say, to a pretty great work. 
leading two million Jews, Hebrews, into slavery. He's the one who gets to go on top of Mount Sinai and he receives the Ten Commandments. He receives the law. It says that he comes back from Sinai and his face was glowing because he got to spend time with God, glowing from the very presence of God. Like Moses, he was a mess. God still loved him. God still used him. King David, perhaps one of the most respected and revered and important people in all of the scriptures. We know that he killed a lion and he killed a bear and he killed this giant whose name was Goliath. You know also that he broke five of the Ten Commandments that are listed. Do you realize that? Literally David, like the King David, we know that he, <clears throat> we know that he committed murder. Uh, Uriah, we know that he lied, he committed adultery, Bathsheba, he coveted his neighbor's wife, and he stole his neighbor's wife, another man's wife. And yet, for some reason, David today is known, and the epitaph is what? What? That David was a man after God's own heart. He broke five, the Ten Commandments that we know about. And yet, for some reason, the boy's a mess. God still loves him and uses him and calls him. There's, there's, like, there's, like, there's like hope for us. Solomon, known as one of the wisest who ever lived, a king with such success, it is hard to measure. He gives us the wisdom of Proverbs. And yet there's a description in Nehemiah chapter 13 that says, among the many nations, there was no king like him. And he was beloved by God. And that same verse continues on in verse 26. Nevertheless, he had a bit of a problem. Foreign women made him even to sin. He had a little bit of problem with women. But, but Solomon was used and is called to build the temple. It represents the very presence of God. Like we're, we're just making our way through here. Rahab was a prostitute, a prostitute, which means she sold her body. She lied. And yet in Hebrews chapter 11, she is mentioned as a woman with distinction because she had faith in God. How does that work? There's hope for us. Be encouraged by that. The apostle Peter, traditionally regarded as the lead or the chief of all the apostles, has the dubious distinction for having been known as the one who denied Christ, not once, not twice, but three times. The third time, it actually says that he begins to curse and to swear, I never knew him. It doesn't sound very saintly to me, Saint Peter. And yet God chose him and called him to be the rock of which this church is to be built upon. John, he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. I think there's a little bit of a pride issue there. He and James were caught brothers, sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder. Okay, uh, Jesus actually caught them and said, hey boys, what are you talking about? And they just said, oh, well, nothing. And he said, no, you're talking about who's the greatest in all of the kingdom. And this is James and John, the inner circle, alongside of Peter. Matthew was a publican. Publicans were tax collectors. They were universally regarded simply as scoundrels. They, they extorted money. Whatever they gathered, whatever they could squeeze out of the poor, Okay, they would give a little bit that was due and then they would keep everything else themselves. He was a thief, yet God called him to write a gospel of God's amazing majesty. Simon was a member of the Zealot Party. They were a violent revolutionary group that pledged to over, overthrow the Roman occupiers. Like that was... That was Simon, another one. Thomas, his claim to fame was that he, he, he doubted Jesus' resurrection. Mary Magdalene, who was reputed to have been a, a prostitute before Jesus cast out seven demons. So she was a demon-possessed 
prostitute, and yet she what clearly is one who is the first that Jesus appears to after his resurrection. All of this, Paul considered the hero. Paul, who probably, as Dan said, sinned less than Dan this morning. And yet we know that he was described as one who persecuted the church of God beyond measure and he tried to destroy it. Yet God didn't give up on him, used him, and he built and established missionary journeys and planted churches all over the place. Are you, are you, are you getting this here? Are you getting it? It seems like everyone that God chooses to use in some way has messed up, is far from perfect. And yet all the way through, we see one that comes to the surface as the only one who is perfect. There's only one. Peter describes him as what? That one without spots or blemish. I love that description. John the Baptist said, behold, saw Jesus, behold. That's the one who comes, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. It brings us to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14. We look at this and we listen. And the promise by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. But that's that picture, that's that word image from Jeremiah that says he's molding us and he is making us. So we know the work of salvation is complete and perfect. He's done it. He's done it once and for all time. The saving, perfecting work of his people is complete and it's complete forever. If you put your faith and your trust in him. Does it mean we're, we're, we're perfect? We are made perfect in attitude. No, 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 no. Which brings us to the second part. The work of sanctification is promised and progressive. The Greek present tense is important here. It's an ongoing, continuous action that we're not yet fully sanctified. We're not yet committing no sin. But that's the part that comes alive with the work of the Holy Spirit. Surrender and submission to the authority of the word of God and listening to other people as they speak into our lives. The deeper purpose at work in this mess is one single theme that weaves and works its way all the way through the Bible, God's gracious plan to redeem needy sinners like you and I. Oh, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Be aware, certainly, of our own sinlessness, the powerlessness to save ourselves, but we trust and believe in the truth of the gospel. Trust in his work is sufficient to save. His work is sufficient to save and to sanctify. I will close with this. The clock in the back is wrong. Don't pay any attention to it. One pastor wrote, Abraham lied. Sarah laughed at God's promises. Moses stuttered. David's armor didn't fit. John Mark was rejected by Paul. Timothy had ulcers. Hosea's wife, Gomer, was a prostitute. Amos' only training was in the school of fig tree pruning. Jacob was a liar. David had an affair. Solomon was too rich. Jesus was too poor. Abraham was too old. David was too young. Peter was afraid of death. Lazarus was dead. John was self-righteous. Naomi was a widow. Paul was a murderer. So was Moses. Jonah ran from God. Miriam was a gossip. Gideon and Thomas both doubted. Jeremiah was depressed and suicidal. Elijah was a burnout. John the Baptist was a loudmouth. Mary was a worry wart. Martha, excuse me, was a worry wart. And Mary had been lazy. Samson had long hair. Noah got drunk. Did I mention that Moses had a short fuse? Oh, so did Peter and Paul and lots of them. I, I think it's pretty easy to add our name to this long list. Be encouraged. The work of Christ is sufficient. His salvation is perfect and complete. And he is in his grace and unconditional love. He's doing a work. Sanctifying us. Setting us apart. Shaping us. Making us. And making us 
holy in his image and rejoice. Be thankful for that. Father, we love you and we are amazed at your love for us. Thank you for reminding us all the way through scripture, all the way through that we, we today fit into this long line of people that you can use. Broken, but when our faith and our trust is in you, we can be made whole for your glory. Lord, make us that. In your name we pray. Amen.